In this video, I'm going to explain the cause of threshold roll-off in short channels. We saw this in a previous lecture. Below a 1 micron gate length, there is a suppression of the threshold voltage, which then raises the leakage current through short channel devices. This short channel effect is a consequence of the drain voltage pulling down the potential barrier in the channel, typically referred to as drain-induced barrier lowering, which is a byproduct of the drain having voltage where it invades the gate and the effective gate length becomes shorter. So if we look at a schematic of a planar MOSFET, we have the gate in the middle, we have the drain to the right, the source to the left, you have a P-body, and the drain electrode is attached to an N-pad, and the source electrode is attached to an N-pad. So from the drain to the source, you go through two PN junctions, one from N to P and the other one from P to N. And that is where this behavior originates. The drain is inevitably at a higher potential than the source and probably at a higher potential than the gate. So this N to P junction is reverse biased because when you raise the potential on the N side, you're reverse biased and you have a depletion region that forms between the N and the P-type. The next junction is forward biased because you're going from P to N and inevitably the source is going to be at the lowest potential and so that's forward biased and we will be concerned mostly with the consequences then of the drain junction being reverse biased and consequently being in depletion. I'll remind you of the energy level diagram of a PN junction. So on the N type, the energies are going to be lower. Because remember, these are electron energies. Over in the P type, bands bend upward. And this is in thermal equilibrium. And it's almost a necessary situation in order to have the Fermi level be closer to the conduction band on the N side and closer to the valence band on the P side when you're in thermal equilibrium, the Fermi energy has to be a horizontal line, so it has to be this way. And the step you go up is that built-in potential. So we have that playing out inside of a planar MOSFET. This is just the conduction band edge. As you go from the N-type into the P-type, the conduction band edge steps up. You go across the P-type, and then as you go from the P-type to the next N-type, the conduction band edge steps down. Now, if the drain has got some voltage on it, the energy is actually going to be lower in the drain side. And I, I might emphasize, where are these the energies? These energies are actually up here at the, near the surface. An electron leaves the source terminal, goes through the end material, through the P body, into the end material. And so that's what this conduction band edge I've sketched pertains to. So when you get to the drain side, the conduction band edge is going to drop down a lot lower if you have a positive voltage applied to the drain, and so it pushes that energy down lower. And so that's kind of why it looks like that. The difference between the conduction band edge under the drain and the conduction band edge under the source is the applied drain source voltage. In this illustration, the gate voltage is just wherever the source is, and usually the source is grounded. So now let's raise the gate voltage up to the threshold voltage. And you see what happens in the gate region. The conduction band edge has to come down because we've placed this positive voltage on the gate. So now there's reduction in the potential energy for an electron in this region. So you go from there, where you have zero volts at the gate, to there, where you have positive voltage at the gate, something higher at least. Let's do one more thing. Let's do something to the drain. Right now, the drain is greater than the gate, and the gate is greater than the source. Well, let's keep it that way, but let's make the drain even larger. So now when we make the drain even larger, I'll toggle between these two images. You see what happens. There's the drain before it gets even larger, and the drain gets even larger. The conduction bandage drops down even more. So the rolling off needs to start even sooner as you approach the even larger depletion region. So this is what happens in a planar MOSFET when you bias the drain to a higher and higher level. This conduction band edge at the drain goes down, which doesn't do a whole lot to the performance because if an electron wants to cross, it has to climb this hill, which is not really affected by the drain voltage. By thermionic emission, it gets over that hill, 
and it gets over here and it doesn't really matter how deep the energy level drops it's like water going over a waterfall it doesn't care how far down the waterfall goes it's going to go down the waterfall and so the electrons get over here and they go to a lower potential and they enter the drain terminal but what does happen is that this region where you have the barrier as you should call it does get shorter it would take a ton of voltage on the drain, though, to make that really matter. I, and we can only take the drain so high, you know, a couple of volts at most, and then you just can't go any higher. It doesn't have a huge effect. However, if the junction is short, like less than a micron, as I showed in that opening picture there, hundreds of nanometers or shorter, then what happens when you raise the drain? So we go back to our picture. I've deliberately made the drain appear short, just uh, for effect. This is our starting position where the drain is greater than the gate, is greater than the source. And the gate is at threshold, which means that electrons can get over here. Let's raise the drain voltage and look what happens now. Now when we raise up the drain voltage, this depletion region gets a lot larger because we are reverse biasing the junction and it really invades our barrier. This conduction band edge gets dragged down a lot. I can't find room in my picture to really emphasize that, but it got dragged down a lot. The rolling off has to start really, really close to the source. And consequently, this barrier never gets all the way up to the height it had been at, and it starts to go back down. And that's called drain-induced barrier lowering. When you add positive voltage to the drain on a P-body or negative voltage on an N-body, the potential barrier gets suppressed when that voltage starts to rise. The amount that the potential barrier is suppressed by is the threshold voltage is where it might have been, but now it's the difference between threshold voltage when there's no suppression whatsoever and the threshold voltage when there is suppression. So we have a certain threshold voltage. When the channel was longer, we had a different threshold voltage because this effect wasn't going on. And so VT long simply means the threshold voltage when the channel is long enough that this drain-induced barrier lowering isn't noticed. This was a pictorial depiction of how putting voltage on the drain of a short channel lowers the threshold voltage. This 1996 paper presented a model. It's got a lot of detail on it, so I'm not going to go through it. We're going to go with the result of that model. This is not an empirical equation here. There's logic behind these elements. The 0.4 volts is the typical voltage drop across these PN junctions. L sub G is the length of the gate from the source to the drain. The script L is called the Dibble parameter, and so we need to talk about that. It clearly has dimensions of length. But this is the model now for the threshold voltage in a short channel minus the threshold voltage that it would in a long channel. So if you made the channel long, you just have a certain threshold voltage. But as we get really short, it starts to go down. So the shorter a channel gets, once it's below several hundred nanometers, the threshold voltage starts to become noticeably lower. So if you inspect the expression we just came up with for the difference between the threshold voltage in a short channel and a long channel, I think you will realize that the difference becomes more pronounced with a really small gate. As this exponential becomes e to the zero, then this whole term here becomes non-negligible. If you have a really long gate, this is e to the minus big number, and so the threshold voltage minus the threshold voltage when it's long is zero. In other words, you already are long. But as L sub g, the gate length gets really small, this exponential stops being negligible. And this right side of the sequence is something that's got to be taken into account. So what we really want to do is, as L sub g gets shorter and shorter, to avoid having this e to the minus Lg over Ld become 1, you want to make the Dibble parameter small too. And the Dibble parameter is the geometric mean of these three depths, the oxide thickness, the depletion width, and the junction depths. I need to illustrate each one of those for you. 
oxide thickness is something we're familiar with, and the depletion depth is something we're pretty familiar with, but junction depth is a new dimension to think about. It's the depth of this n-type region in the drain. That's what big X sub J is. Now, you take the geometric mean of these three numbers, they each have dimensions of length, and you get a length. What I'd point out is the gate length is a horizontal dimension, and these three lengths are vertical dimensions. So if you change this horizontal dimension, the expression here for the Dibble parameter tells you how much the vertical dimensions need to change in order to prevent the threshold voltage from getting too suppressed. That's scaling in two dimensions. It's two-dimensional similitude. Something that is completely vertical in the denominator of this exponential and something that's completely horizontal in the numerator. So last time I referenced the virtual source model as a method that was used to derive an expression for the drain source current as a function of the gate source voltage. I give you this expression, and now let's inspect it quickly. If you took the log of the drain source current and plotted it versus the gate source voltage, you'd have a straight line. This is the sub-threshold current only. When it's a straight line, your sub-threshold, then you reach threshold, it starts to bend, and up here we're clearly outside a threshold, and you might refer to an equation in chapter 6, such as 6.6.6, .6 to describe the current up here. But when we're sub-threshold, is down here. A few things I'd point out about this graph. First of all, the gate source voltage is going from zero to the drain source voltage, whatever it is. And that's as far as it can go. Now, why is that? If you looked at over here in the bottom corner, a NFET, the source, say, is at ground. It's got to be somewhere. Let's put it at ground. The drain is usually hooked up to the power supply, so V sub DD is the power supply voltage. That's the highest voltage in the system. And if ground is the lowest voltage in the system, the gate can only go between ground and the power supply voltage. So you can start at zero and you can end at V sub DD at the power supply voltage, which is always the drain source voltage. So that's why it stops there. There's a for instance in this graph, and the for instance is that the drain source voltage is small. And let's just say 0.1 volt. That's small. You're definitely uh, not putting as much voltage on that drain as you could put. Power supplies are usually a volt or two. So let's raise that drain source voltage up to one volt. What that does is that puts extra carriers in the system. It, it injects at the source additional electrons that can pass through the MOSFET to the drain. That shows up as an increased current. If you have a long channel, you won't notice it because drift velocity is extremely slow. And so if you're switching you know, quickly, like you know every nanosecond, you will never notice those injected carriers getting all the way across the MOSFET. But for a short channel, you will notice it. And so for a short channel, this current goes up. The drain source current goes up. That's a measurable artifact of drain-induced barrier lowering. Now you can read a lot from this graph. For example, if I just looked at where the curve ends when gate source voltage is high, that is it, the gate is at the same potential as the drain, that's where we say the MOSFET is on in, in CMOS. So the current that is passing through the MOSFET when the MOSFET is on is wherever this curve is meeting the gate source equals drain source condition. Read it from the curve where there's actually a significant voltage on the drain. We favor that all the time because we can also read the off current, which is when the gate source voltage is zero, favoring the curve where there's actually voltage placed on the drain. That's where you would read the off current. There are these two curves then with the low and the high voltage on the drain. That's an artifact of drain-induced barrier lowering, and we will look at their separation in voltage. Because the separation in voltage, which I'm again giving another for instance of 50 millivolts perhaps, is a good measure of how much dibble there is. Quantification of drain-induced barrier lowering is found by taking the separation between these two curves where you have no voltage on the drain, and where you have power supply voltage on the drain, you take that separation and you divide it by the difference in drain source voltage between these two curves, you have the dibble. 
the drain induced barrier lowering. You put the gate source voltage difference in millivolts and the drain source voltage difference in volts, and so the units are millivolts per volt. In this particular illustration, Dibble equals 55 millivolts per volt. The subthreshold swing can be determined from looking at just the top curve, the one where we have drain voltage turned on, although they'll both give the same result because remember all we're interested in is the slope of this curve to get subthreshold swing. Because remember, subthreshold swing is the answer to the question, what is the delta gate source voltage when the current goes up a factor of 10? And since I made this a logarithmic scale, it's a small length in the graph. And so you can read the delta gate source voltage, and that's your sub-threshold swing. And finally, the threshold voltage can be estimated from this graph. It's very hard to do. It's basically where the log current goes from being linear to not linear. And so I can read it right there. There is another industry standard rule that's used, which is that the threshold voltage is reached when you're at 1% of the on current. So if you read the sound current and you go down to 1% of it and go over and read the voltage, call that the threshold voltage. If you happen to have a graph of log of drain source current versus gate source voltage, use that rule to estimate the threshold voltage. What I need to start talking to you about next is lowering the Dibble parameter. That is the depletion width, the junction thickness, and the oxide thickness. I'll have to be quantities that can be reduced in order to keep the Dibble parameter small so that we don't actually suffer from drain-induced barrier lowering. That's what the next three short lectures are going to be about.